guys, my name is Vanessa Lopez and I am a registered nurse. I just recently graduated from West Coast in March of 2018, Ontario campus. I'm currently working on my master's degree in education, so today I will be running your simulation on blood administration. So, my expectations for today are that you'd be able to distinguish what types of patients are going to require blood transfusions as well as possible adverse effects to look out for and educate your patient on when administering blood and how to intervene when a reaction takes place. Uh, the final step, we're going to be walking through the entire process from beginning to end of the blood administration process, okay? We're not going to skip any steps, we're going to do the full thing, get the full experience. So I have whiteboards on your desks as well as a marker. I went ahead and wrote questions on my PowerPoint here. I just want you to write the answers to yourself. Don't use Google, don't use your friends. I just want to see what your prior knowledge is. Um, once you're done answering the question, just go ahead and hold it up for me so that I could um, go ahead and see what you guys know. So the first question is, in what situation would a patient require a blood transfusion? So go ahead and write that down and you guys can just hold it up for me and I can see. All right, awesome. Great. Bless you. Good. All right, you guys actually got a lot of decent ones. Very creative. So you guys are all absolutely right. Um, the patient situations that I have here on the board are just a few. They could be in a motor vehicle accident, a gunshot wound. They're possibly going into surgery, so they want to be proactive and have backup blood just in case. They're anemic, or they're in ICU and they have a GI bleed. These are all possible situations in which a patient would require a blood transfusion. Okay, next question. What size IV do you need to administer blood? Great. Yep. You guys are all absolutely right. You guys are so smart. <laughs> all right, so yeah, 18 gauge or 20 gauge IVs are preferred. Anything smaller than that, you'll be lysing or cutting in half those blood cells and the patient is not gonna be getting the blood that they need. Um, you know, half blood cells are not gonna be helpful to the patient. You need that full red blood cell in order to um, bring back, you know, restore them to that, or bring up the hemoglobin at least. Um, so, what kind of tubing is required for blood transfusion? Good. Great. Yep, that's absolutely right. So, why tubing is required for blood transfusion? Um, reason being, you're going to be uh, hanging both blood and saline together. Not at the same time, obviously but you are going to use the saline at the end, at the beginning, to prime the lines. Um, so this is our uh, second to last question. Um, this is an NCLEX style question you probably might have read about or heard in your lecture. What group of individuals may be against a blood transfusion? Good. Perfect, perfect. Yes, so uh, Jehovah's Witness, um, of course this group is not always going to refuse blood. It is your responsibility as the nurse to always educate your patient. Um, you want to make sure that you're letting them know what the purpose of the transfusion is as well as any risks or benefits to the transfusion and they get to make that decision whether or not they're going to refuse or they're going to you know, say yes, I want the blood. Um, and that's not just to say that only Jehovah's Witness is going to say no. Anyone can refuse blood, depending on what their beliefs are, or they just don't want it, they're scared. You definitely want to always educate, though, and not assume ever that they're going to refuse. Last question that I have on my PowerPoint. What symptoms will your patient experience if having an adverse reaction? Good? Yes. Perfect. Yes. So there are many 
different reactions that can take place in for a patient when getting a blood transfusion. I'm just going to talk about two of them, one being one of the least dangerous and one being one of the more dangerous types. So the first one being the mild febrile transfusion reaction. This is where the patient might have chills or fever or they might have itching. Depending on your policy, you're going to either turn it off and call the doctor or leave it on and call the doctor. Um, me personally, I would probably turn it off and get a hold of the doctor. Um, and usually they'll order something like a, a Tylenol and Benadryl. Depending on your hospital policy, doctors may even order this prior to the transfusion even taking place, no matter if the patient has had a reaction in the past or not. Definitely one of those questions you want to ask is uh, to your patient is, have you ever had a blood transfusion? And uh, whether or not they say yes or no, you want to ask them, hey, have you ever had a reaction when you were receiving that blood? Just so that you kind of have an appeal for what to look out for when you're giving the uh, transfusion. Sometimes the doctor may even ask you to, you know, slow it down further from what the rate that we're technically supposed to, to um, administer with. The more dangerous type, of course, of reactions is a hemolytic transfusion reaction. And this is where the patient may have received the wrong type of blood. And this is why we do our two RN checks, just to kind of avoid this from happening. So some of these symptoms include flank pain, uh, low blood pressure, dark urine, shortness of breath, fever, chills. They may even have pain at the IV site. Uh, some complications that they can go into include shock or even DIC, so the patient may be bleeding out and coagulating, but you know that coagulation is just not enough. It's they're going to continuously be bleed, bleeding out. So in this type of reaction, this is where you definitely want to stop the blood, gather your supplies, send it out to the lab. They're going to do some type of investigation to see what ha what happened, what went wrong, and then the doctor may order several things depending on what the symptoms are. So m most of the time they'll order a bolus of saline. Uh, it might not just be one, it might be multiple because they really want to flush that out. Uh, most likely a diuretic to help the patient urinate and get rid of all that yucky stuff out of the body because it's uh, definitely going to cause some complications. And depending on the symptoms, if they're having hypotension, they may order some vasopressors to help increase the uh, blood pressure, most of the time it's dopamine. And if they're in DIC, they might even order some more blood products, such as plasma or platelets. So, where do we start? Uh, the first step of the transfusion is definitely the doctor's order. Can't do anything without a doctor's order. So, I have passed out some flyers. Uh, with the copy of the doctor's order on it. So usually it'll tell you what type of blood product you're going to be administering. In this case, we are administering one unit of packed red blood cells. And then it'll give you some type of parameter. So in this case, the doctor wants a hemoglobin. If the hemoglobin is less than 7, administer one unit of PRVCs. Next, they'll order a typing screen. Um, the lab will come and draw some blood. It's usually in a pink vial like this. And they'll go ahead and put a wristband on your patient called a blood band. It'll have a number that you're going to be comparing with a second nurse to make sure that you have the right patient and the right blood. Once those two steps are done, this is where the consent process comes in. Uh, this is the perfect time for you to educate your patient make them aware of why you're giving them blood, what can happen if they receive blood, and what can happen if they don't receive blood. Um, you definitely want to have them sign the consent form to make them fully educated, ask all their questions, or answer all their questions. If it's a patient that's intubated or unable to speak for themselves, definitely you want to check their advanced directive to see who's listed on there as first person or their next of kin, and then the doctor has to sign. This all has to be done prior to any, any even grabbing the blood from the lab. All of this has to be done because most likely the lab will ask for the order and for the consent form. 
And finally, the next step before you go, or well, after you have grabbed your blood, you've already called lab, they've already asked you to come pick it up, so now you have it in your hands, the blood. You're going to grab a buddy, so a second RN, and you're going to verify the identity of the patient and that you have the correct bag. So this is just a copy from Chino, um, and you're going to verify several things. You're going to make sure that the blood band number matches the blood on this form. It will have a number on here that matches the wristband. At least it should if you have the right patient. Um, you'll also check the expiration date of the blood. You want to check that the number is on the blood matches your forms. And then you'll have both sign. Uh, at Chino, it's on paper still. At other hospitals, it might be on the computer. So you'll sign, and that second RN will sign. That's to make sure that you did the two RN check. And then together, you'll take those vital signs, the pre-vital signs before you even start the, uh, the transfusion, just to see what the baseline of the patient is. So now that we went over all of those steps, we're going to go ahead and do it together, OK? Any questions about that? No questions? OK. Well, I appreciate it. I will meet you guys in the next room, and we'll get started. So now we're going to be doing on the hands-on portion. Um, with a show of hands, how many of you guys have hung blood out in simulation, in clinical? Has anyone hung blood before? OK. Was it, has it been a while, or has it recently? Do you guys feel comfortable with doing it on your own, or do you need a step-by-step? feel comfortable you guys are so okay refresher sounds good all right so the first step obviously before you start messing with all your tubing and your fluids you definitely always want to make sure you're going to the right patient so you definitely gonna look at their wristband you're gonna ask them what's your name and date of birth well at first obviously you're gonna introduce yourself you don't want to jump in the room so hi my name is Vanessa I'm gonna be your nurse today hey please have your name and date of birth and then go ahead and repeat that to you Ask them if they have any allergies. Alrighty, Mrs. Jones, we are going to be doing your blood transfusion now, the one that you signed the consent for. So I want to go ahead and, you know, you would educate them if you, or repeat your education if you haven't done it before when you were doing the consent form, obviously. And then um, ask them if you haven't, if they've had a reaction before in the past. Um, and then that's when you're going to do your checks with your second nurse. So you're going to go ahead and grab, you usually get your blood bag, and you're going to get some papers, some documentation forms, and you're going to do that check with the second nurse. So, alrighty, Mrs. Jones, so I have Crystal here. She's a second nurse. She's going to help me out to make sure that we're giving you the right type of blood. So we're gonna go ahead and just do that really quick and then we'll get you started with that blood transfusion. So when I, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna say it and then you're gonna repeat everything I say back to you. So this is Valerie Jones. Valerie Jones. Um, also, and you're gonna be checking the band as well. Okay, Mrs. Jones. Uh, donor number, so you wanna make sure you're looking at the paper and at the blood. Okay. So, donor number is zero, zero. Five four three six three. Number is zero zero five four three six three on both the paper and the blood. Perfect. And we want to verify the patient's MR number. Obviously, like I said, this paper is not going to match the ID, but you want to compare it to the ID band. The patient's MR number is PCS seven four five eight one. So it should say on your paper as well. Patient MR number is PCS74581. Perfect. Okay, uh, the donor type is O negative. Donor type is O negative. And we want to make sure the um, bag is O negative. The bag and is O negative. Perfect. Well. And the recipient is AB positive. Recipient is AB positive. And the expiration date on the blood bag is today at 2000. Today at 2000. Perfect. Okay, so then that's your second, your, your two RN verification. So now I'm gonna go ahead and have you guys practice that for me. So you guys can go ahead to your blood bag. You, you just need one for now. So you 
pair up, um, and then do it by yourselves, okay? All right, go for it. So, <laughs> um, she's going to be helping me with your transfusion today. We're just going to verify your blood. So I'm going to give you this. And it expires today at 2,000. Okay, we're first going to start with this. And then the donor. The donor, we have Mrs. Jones. Patient name. Mrs. Jones. Okay, then we have the donor number. Which is zero zero five four three four four. The donor number zero zero five four three four four. And then also check it on the blood side. Zero zero five four three four four. Then we have the patient MR number, which is PCS seven four five eight one. Patient MR number PCS seven four five eight one. The donor type is O negative. O negative. Donor type ten. Recipient type is AB positive. Recipient type AB positive. And the expiration date on the blood is today at twenty hundred. Expiration is today at twenty hundred. So the next step is, is definitely going to be to prime your line with the semen. So you're not going to jump into the blood quite yet. You've already done your checks, and this is the part where you also do your vital signs. So you're going to do your pre-transfusion vital signs, and then uh, whether you're going to be writing on paper, like at Chinu, like I said, or at another hospital, sometimes they document those online. Just depends on the hospital that you're at. So you're definitely going to take those vital signs, and then that's when you're going to start to prime your line. So. Um, the way you're going to do it is you're going to clamp every single line first. You're going to clamp the two at the top, the blue clamps, and the one at the bottom. You want to definitely have this roller clamp in a, in a position where you can easily have access to it. So once you clamp them all, you're going to spike your bag, and then you're going to open up just the port with the saline. You don't want to open up this second one. So just this port here, and you're going to fill the chamber up to the top and then you're gonna prime it. So you guys all have trash cans by your stations. Um, you're gonna go ahead and prime your line. So you're gonna open up this roller clamp, have it prime all the way to the bottom, make sure you don't have any bubbles in it, and then clamp it again here. Leave, and then you're gonna clamp this one as well, okay? So now I want you guys to go ahead and do that part, and then we'll go into the blood. Good? And that's kind of how you do it in real life too. I, I usually don't spike any bag when it's hanging like that. I just like to hold it. You get more control to put in the spike when you're just holding it in your hand. If you need any help, please let me know. And also the little caps, all the little caps you have, just try to keep them. Don't throw them away. Is the, <laughs> ones, the ones with the blue, blue top, okay. yes. And don't feel rushed, take your time. So the reason why you have to clamp everything is because once I spike this, if I didn't have my saline closed, it will literally just loop back and turn this all pink. And you don't want this to be pink. Um, so that's why you have to have everything clamped. So now after all of my things are clamped, you want to go ahead and spike your bag. 
These, uh, definitely I would recommend getting gloves because it will stain your fingers. And you only have to open one, doesn't matter which one it is. And definitely please, if you can keep the caps and the rubber bands, that would be great. So this thing is out, ooh, we need more ink mess. This is sterile, so you don't want to touch anything with this other than what you're spiking. So you gotta be really careful with that. So now that you got it in, and definitely I like to hold it in my hand like that because if you try to spike it while it's hanging up like that, it's kind of hard to really get your grip on it and put it in. But you definitely want don't want to twist it so much because then you're kinking your line. So then after it's spiked, then you can go ahead and hang your bag. And then you can open up your clamp that's on the blood side. Leave this one clamp still. So you're gonna open that up, and you're gonna squeeze your chamber, and you wanna fill it with blood. So once you got a decent amount in there, you definitely wanna try to keep it to the top. You wanna go ahead and open up the clamp that's on the bottom, and you wanna prime your line. Uh, but what I learned from Professor Muhammad, um, you definitely want to, so you don't want to prime it all the way to the tippy top right here because you want to give the patient some room, you know, if they're going to have a reaction, you don't want it to be immediate right when it touches them if you're priming it all the way to the top. So you prime the blood to maybe about yay high, give some room so that it's like gradual, so there's not like immediate blood, boom. So then go ahead and prime your line. Kayleen, it can be a little pink, obviously. So go ahead and do that. Um, if you need any help, please let me know. And you definitely want to keep this in your hand so that you have control over it. So you can clamp it when it gets to like that point there, okay? All right. And then we'll do the next step after that, okay? You guys got it? All right. You're good. <laughs> so you guys can all use your own. You guys can all use your own blood. I still got you recording. Good, that's great. So yeah, that's perfect. So once you're done, you can just throw it inside of the garbage right there, just so that it doesn't leak all over the floor and all of your shoes. into your pump um, definitely it, it depends on the situation sometimes if you're in trauma like in ER I worked in ER before and uh, if there's a traumatic thing sometimes they have the line open and they're just flushing bags back but the way you want to do it in the hospital is definitely with the pump you want to do it safely safety is always concern for your patient um, if, I mean definitely if you're running it really quickly that's putting the patient definitely at risk for having some type of adverse reaction especially if they're having a reaction where they got the wrong blood, that's gonna be a no-no. So this is the way you're usually supposed to program your pump. Um, in simulation, if you guys are ever gonna go into simulation and hang blood, uh, they usually do want you to do the math on the board because they wanna see your thoughts on paper. So the process um, usually is gonna be, you're gonna be do doing two mil, in the, this is within the fi first 15 minutes. So within the first 15 minutes, you definitely want to stay with the patient the entire time. You want to make sure that they're not having that reaction because that's usually when, it's, when it takes place, is within that first 15 minutes. So to be able to calculate the, the rate for the first 15 minutes, it's going to be two milliliters per minute, and that's going to be within the first 15 minutes. 
So obviously the rate is going to change after that 15 minutes is done with. So the way that you do it, um, so you're going to be multiplying 2 milliliters times 15 minutes. So you're going to be end up getting 30 milliliters in 15 minutes. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So you're going to get 30 milliliters in that first 15 minutes because you're doing 2 milliliters per minute. So then you're going to break apart this because you need this to be in hours because that's how the pump is programmed. It's not programmed in minutes, it's in hours. So you want to turn that into hours. So in the 15 minutes, you have to look at it like quarters. Um, 15 minutes, if you think of quarters, how many quarters are in a dollar? Four. Four. So that's the same as time. So you're going to be multiplying that by four because it's going to, you want to turn minutes to hours. So you're going to multiply one, when you do something to one, you have to do it to the other. So that's going to be equal to 120 milliliters per hour. Okay? So we're going to program it together. So I'm going to actually just turn everything off just so you know how to do it from start to finish. So you're going to obviously, oh, I'll wait for her. It should say powering down on the main screen. Okay, so you're obviously gonna press on. So we'll turn on the machine here. Okay, so. New patient, yes. Are we gonna be doing ICU? We're gonna be doing ICU for now, just for the demonstration. Um, and then we're gonna press confirm here. Mm -hmm. So then you're gonna select a channel, whichever one you're using. So I'll just use this one for an example. So you'll press channel select. And that's whatever pump you're using. So. I'm gonna use this one, so I press channel select and it'll give you this, these options here. So you wanna go ahead and IV fluids here. So then it'll give you a list like this. Can everyone see? Mm -hmm. Everyone see? Okay, so then you're gonna press page down. You wanna look for blood. There's gonna be a blood option. So blood, there's blood platelets and there's blood RBCs. So you wanna make sure you're doing RBCs because we're doing red blood cells. Uh, was this correct? Yes. So then we're going to go back to our math formula that we had over there. So in a standard bag, the way that we're going to do it today is that our bag is going to be 400 milliliters. So, and the rate that we calculated, this one in particular though is 300. So we're going to do it based in real life, 300 milliliters. So. The rate that we came up with was 120 milliliters an hour for the first 15 minutes. So, oh, I already exited me out. Let me go back. So rate, we'll go ahead and press the arrow that says rate and we'll plug in that rate 120 milliliters. Okay, and then press enter. And then the volume to be infused, there's 300 mLs in the bag. So we'll go ahead and put... So we're going to be putting 30 mLs because in the first 15 minutes we're going to be administering 30 mLs based off of the calculation that we did. So 30 mLs. So now we're going to be doing 120 milliliters an hour but just 30 mLs for the first 15 minutes. And then you'll press start. Make sure that your blood is unclamped and it's unclamped down here when it's already attached to the patient and then you'll go ahead and start. Like I said, you wanna stay with the patient for the first 15 minutes to be making sure that there's no reactions and once that 15 minutes is done with, you're gonna take a 15 minute vital signs. 
Okay? And then you'll press confirm on the bottom and then you'll ch select your channel so oh, since you're oh, doing okay. that one and then go ahead and there we go mm -hmm. yes yes perfect 30 for the first 30 30 yes 30 minutes mm-hmm and then you can start. You just want to make sure that your blood is unclamped and then your bottom clamp is unclamped. How are we doing over here? Um, so right before we press start, do we unclamp or do we press start? And um, or does it, it doesn't matter because in here it's already clamped in the machine. Got it. So it's not going to come pouring out. Oh, okay. So then, perfect. So now that you've gone, I want you to turn it off and then let your partner try. So go ahead and um, pause it. Perfect. Uh, just turn the channel off. Perfect. So then you guys will switch spots and you guys will try, your partner will try. Then you want to unclamp your blood, unclamp the bottom clamp, and you guys can go ahead and start, and yeah, so like if it's time. going into your patient. Start. Start. Great. You guys did awesome. So once you've tried, uh, go ahead and turn it off, and then we'll do the math for the remainder of the blood. And then we'll program that into the pump. Um, pretend the doctor's order says that you're gonna transfuse that bag, that 300 ml bag of blood uh, over four hours, okay? So that's what your doctor's order says. So obviously the doctor's order is four hours, but we already did 15 minutes from that. So you definitely want to subtract that four hours or the 15 minutes from the four hours. So does anyone know what that's going to be? So think about quarters again. Um, so obviously it's going to be 3.75? Yeah, 3.75. And that's because if we're thinking quarters, this is like the 25 cents. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got the 3.75. Did everyone get that part? Okay, so then you want to calculate how much is left in the bag of blood. So the bag, the total mLs in the bag was 30 m 300 mLs. So we gave how much already? 30. 30. So you want to subtract that 30 mLs from the 300. Does anyone know the answer to that? I have a calculator here. 270. 270. 270 mLs left in the bag, and we have 3.75 hours left. 
So now, what we do with this information. So we're going to get, so the way that you calculate your remainder rate, that's going to be the remaining volume over the remaining time. So the remaining volume was 270 mLs. And your remaining time was 3.75. And that's already in the correct timing because that's how much the pump is going to calculate. So then you're just going to divide. Does anyone need a calculator now to calculate this? Or can you guys do it in your head? What is 270 divided by 3.75? 